Well, good morning. It is my privilege to be with you this morning. And as you're turning in your Bibles to the book of Jude, um, we will look there in just a moment. Um, Jude is right before Revelation, by the way. If you're looking it up in your, in your Bible, one that gets skipped over a lot. It's a little book, one chapter. It is a joy to be with you. And I want to just very quickly just express my gratitude to you as a congregation in a couple of ways. One, just through the gifts that you have blessed us with as a congregation. As many of you know, during Harvey, um, several of the churches in our region served, and you were uh, one of those churches that were regularly um, coming to the Houston area, to Paraland, to serve us while we were in great need, <laughs> great physical need. And you gave us, Aaron, for it felt like a month, brother, of just every um, every waking hour for a month, he was giving his attention to us to help us manage through care for our community, uh, ex- you know, care into the city broadly, into Houston. And so thank you so much. I have benefited. We've benefited Aaron's care, his love. John regularly uh, cares for me personally, cares for our congregation. Bart, getting to know more and more, has preached in Pearland. All three men have preached in Pearland, and everyone said, when are they coming back? So you are a blessed congregation with the gifts that you have here on a regular basis. And so it is, it is just a joy to have the privilege to open up God's word this morning. And so greetings from Pearland. Greetings uh, from uh, your sister church. Uh, they love you and thank God for you. Now I have to find Jude. There it is. We're going to read this morning from verses 17 to the end of the chapter, verse 25. We're going to focus our attention on verses 20 and 21. Um, And I'll do my best not to preach the whole chapter. John said we we normally go for about an hour and a half. That was was one of those laughs, like, ha, 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 ha. That was funny. Yeah. God's holy, infallible, inerrant word. Amen. But you must remember... Beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, And praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. To have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now, Lord, that you would open our ears, open our eyes, give us spiritual sight, give us hearing, Holy Spirit, that we might behold wonderful things from your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, frequently in action films, a skilled soldier or an agent or a super gets paired with a normal. That's us. Maybe some of you aren't. A normal human being. And almost always at some point in the height of action, they end up in a car. I don't know why, but they always end up in a car. And at some point, the hero tells the normal what? Stay right here in the car. I'll be right back. And we all know what happens. Two scenes later, the evil has the normal. They've gotten out of the car. They've tried to go help, and they've been caught. 
And the sidekick never stays in the car. A couple of minutes later, the enemies are taunting the hero. Jude is a small book with a large message. You can find that message primarily in verse 3 of the book, one chapter. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. There's a battle to be waged. There is conflict going on in the early church. There are false teachers that have come in and have begun to undermine the apostles' teaching. It's, the book of Jude has, all, and I kind of wish we could read through the whole book, but we don't have time for that this morning. So this afternoon, you have time. Read through the book of Jude. But it has all the feels of an Old Testament prophet. It's just got this, this wild, uh, beautiful simile and metaphor and these pictures of, of what some have described as the book Not the acts of the apostles, but the acts of the apostates, one commentator calls it. But the the point of the book isn't to highlight just apostates. It's it's to equip the saints to walk through the battle. What does it look like to navigate through the battle? To equip those who have been called by God, those who have been saved, those who have placed their faith in Jesus. This morning, we've been singing about the gospel. We've been singing the gospel. We had maybe the most beautiful physical form in which the Lord Jesus himself left us. And I say maybe because we have two forms. We have baptism and communion. These two physical forms that God, that Jesus leaves us as demonstrations of the gospel. And so we even rehearsed the gospel and considered it through communion this morning as we remember what Jesus has done. And so Jude addresses These saints, these who he says are called ones, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. We could read through the first few verses. We're going to jump right to 17 and pick back up. So what Jude does, he has this three-verse introduction, and then he goes off on the apostates. Here's who they are, these false teachers in the church. Those who are saying, it doesn't matter what you do, we have grace. Essentially, it was a, a group teaching licentiousness. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Just the opposite of what Paul says, right? When he says, should we sin more that grace may abound? Certainly not. By no means. And so he's, a, he's addressing these, you might have heard the term antinomian, those who are against the law. It doesn't matter what you do now that you're following Jesus. He's addressing these folks, and he picks back up with the beloved in verse 17, and that's where we want to start now. So beginning with verse 17, Jude turns his attention back to the beloved. I don't want to move too quickly past the glorious term beloved. I I want that to just set on you for a moment. You're here, you're in Christ, you've placed your faith in Jesus. God has saved you. God has redeemed you. Then you are beloved of God. He's addressing those who are his, who belong to him, these faithful saints. I don't know about you, but I I could just skim by that word. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm beloved. Beloved of God, the Holy One, who created all that is. Beloved by him who dwells in the heavens, who rides on the winds, who controls the seas. Beloved by him who has knows no sin, no, no shadow of turning. Beloved by the Lord, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Beloved by him. Don't want to move quickly past that. We started a little practice in Paraland. When I say beloved, the congregation is supposed to say amen. You don't have to do that because it would be a little weird for you. But if you want to, you may. Some of our people, and you've met them, they like that. And so when I say beloved, they say amen. But our hearts should say amen, saints. We're, we're beloved of the Lord. Our hearts should say amen. And we'll even see how it is we can be considered the beloved as we move through the text this morning. But you must remember beloved, the apostle, 
their prediction. So there's a, a connection to the apostles' teaching. This is a connection to the teaching of Jesus. It's a connection to the foundation that was laid in opposition to these apostate teachers. And then for the second time in four verses, he says it again. Verse 20. He says, but you beloved. I don't want to move too quickly past beloved. Here's why, saints. Here's, here's why many of our struggles and problems in the Christian walk come from a failure to appropriate the cross in terms of love for us on a daily basis. The Lord loves us. How do we know this? We know this fundamentally and primarily through the work of Jesus on the cross, through the gospel and what he has accomplished. This holy God has condescended to us to relate to us, but not just to relate to us, not just to use us, not just to affect us, but to love us, to show and demonstrate his love to us. You will see why this is so important when we get into verse 20. Beloved, you who are here in Christ are the beloved of God. He loved you while you were a rebel against him. He loved you by exposing your rebellion and changing your heart. He loved you by paying the price of your sin. He loved you by taking up residence within you. He loves you by progressively changing you to look more and more like him. You are the beloved of God if you are in Christ this morning. I want to encourage you, saints, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what condition you find yourself in. If you are in Christ, you are the beloved of Almighty God, the beloved of him who created all things. 1 John 4.10, you know this verse. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation, a sufficient sacrifice, pleasing a just wrath against us, a propitiation for our sins, a beloved, a person dearly loved and cherished, sometimes preferred above all others and treated with partiality. You would think at this point, now that Jude begins to turn, he's had this long several verses of here's the apostates. Okay, beloved, you think he would say, okay, now kick out the apostates. You would think he would start with clean house, right? You think he would begin in verse 20 with, okay, now these are the, verse 19 highlights it. These, find verse 19. See, we have this giant pulpit Bible back home. It's, is it not giant? We had to move it out of the way, these brothers. It's like this big. And so now I'm staring at this little tiny Bible. And I'm getting old. You see the gray hairs. It's hard to see. 19, it is those who cause division, these are those teachers, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. And then he goes, but you beloved, there you see, you learn, <laughs> beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith. That's a turn I, turn I did not expect. I expect, now get busy and clean, at, clean house. And there's certainly appropriate passage that get, passages in the scripture that get to clean house. But you would think Jude would just say, kick them out, get rid of the apostates. But that's not where he goes. That's not what he says. He addresses the faithful followers of Jesus. He gives them the spiritual equivalent of stay in the car. I've done this great work for you. Now there's something you're going to do. You're going you're to stay in the car. You're going to keep yourself in the love of God. You're going you're gonna to remain here in the love. Beloved, remain in what I've provided for you. Stay in the car. But you, beloved, keep yourselves, verse 21, in the love of God. And, and the way we're going to move through this text now, there's really just one command in the passage. And it's, it's the command of keeping yourself in the love of God. And then there are... Um, some conditions to that that are built in in verse 20 and 21 or, or responses to God in that. Be clear, saints. For us to desire God, God has worked on our behalf. Everything in the Christian life is a response to what God has done. We do not initiate and we do not sustain and we do not keep ultimately. Preservation is of the Lord. 
perseverance is a gift that he gives us that works itself out in time and space and place. And that's the Bible again and again tells us things to do. But those things are not causal and they do not ultimately keep us. But there are things we're to engage in. So remember that as we work through. And you'll see it at the end because Jude wants to make sure we understand that. So he helps us with a doxology. And that's where you get to shout. Or however you do it. Raise your hand silently. Whatever you do. Keep yourself in the love of God. It's not passive here. In Jude, God himself, the lover of our souls, gives us three ways we can remain in his love. Stay in the car. The battle against worldliness or apostasy, in this case, these false teachers saying keep yourselves in the love of God by one, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Verse 20. So, how do we stay in the car? Title of the sermon, stay in the car. Stay in the car. Keep yourselves in the love of God by building yourself up in your most holy holy faith. The faith is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are trusting in God. Takes us back to verse 1, 2, and 3, which we read. It is about the gospel. Even Jude's like, I just want to go off and celebrate about the gospel with you. I want to rejoice in what Jesus has done, but we got some problems I got to deal with. So he then begins to deal with the problems. And as it gets near the the end, he does what he says he wanted to do from the beginning anyway. He goes back to address the beloved. And to remind them to keep themselves in the love of God by building, number one, building yourself up in your most holy faith. The faith faith referenced here in verse 20 is certainly the faith referenced back in verse 3. It's a battle all Christians are called to take up. We're to, to battle in the faith. There is a particular call to elders within the church to defend the faith. You can look at... Titus 1.9, and there's certainly a call to that, to defend the flock, to make sure that false teachers are put right. And then where they resist that, there's a process by which we plead with them to confess their sins and turn to Christ. And in some cases, they themselves excommunicate themselves by their false doctrine. But here, the emphasis is more on us, each of us as members. What we're to do in the midst of this is to remember the love of God for us by building ourselves up in our most holy faith. The Bible has no category for a pacifist Christian when it comes to the truth of God. The faith must be contended for against false teachers who have turned the grace of God into an excuse to sin or have turned what the law into a means of salvation. Either direction in scripture. Legalism and license are always things that were antinomianism, those are totally against the law, no place, and then those who would say, Unless you behave this way, there is no salvation. To put things up in behavior is causal or redemptive. Within the church, especially speaking against false teachers and false living is necessary. But I think at this point, being that we're generally, and I'll use this term, generally understand the doctrines of grace, sometimes we can become vigorous in our defense of doctrines of grace in ways that are unhelpful, kind of a last man standing battle. Like, hey, we're to defend the faith. We're to contend for the faith. And so you just pull out the sword and start swinging 360 degrees. I did that for years as a young man. Just like, oh, I can't wait. Thank the Lord there was no social media back then. God preserved me. I'm sorry for all you young guys who have to walk through with social media. Have to backtrack. Be careful what you put on social media. Be cautious. It's not just a last man standing match. The, the point that Judas making here is you need to address your own soul on these issues. You need to address your own heart on these issues. And so the emphasis is on your own heart and on your own soul in the the broadest sense. It's the building of our lives on the truth of God's word. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. How are we going to do that? You're here this morning. That's one means of grace. Coming together with God's people is one means that he gives by which we are built up into the truth of God. Certainly, it is rooted in the word of God. It is rooted in what God has revealed about himself and about how we live in his word, how he has revealed gospel truth right here to us. The building analogy is is frequent in the New Testament, and the emphasis upon building in an ongoing way, therefore, We're we're to build on a sure foundation, 1 Corinthians 3.10. We won't turn there right now. 
Jude wants to, to see the whole of our lives. Therefore, God is establishing the whole of our lives. Our intellects, our actions, our consciences, our motives, and our imagination brought increasingly into conformity to God's word. Keep yourself in the love of God. How? By building yourself up in the most holy faith. Are you building yourself up in the most holy faith? See, this is a response you know, when someone gets converted, isn't it amazing when God saves someone who has no Bible background whatsoever, that they have a love for God's word almost instantaneously as they're dwelt, indwelt by the Spirit. There's an appetite for God's word. There's a desire for God's word. And I'm not suggesting it's just a linear line and never ending and just always increasing because we would all be discouraged here this morning, wouldn't we, to know the ups and downs of our appetites. But you recognize, there's now a recognition, an awareness. It resonates. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And you're like, yes, amen, the Lord is good. I'm now hungry for God's word. I'm now building my life upon God's word. We build ourselves up in the most holy faith by knowing God's word, by believing God's word, and by obeying God's word. We have to know it. Is it just that these are simple things that God gives? I'm so glad he's simple. For me, that he gives us his word to read. Saints, it doesn't, it doesn't work this way. We have to open it, read, read God's word, feed on God's word. And I know that's one thing we can just, if we're not careful, beat each other up with. You know, and then we can compare one another. I read so much. I know so much. That's not what he's talking about here. And you know that. You know it's the, the feeding and the building. It's the growth in knowledge. And so when, when we hear someone growing, we should encourage that. We, we should seek, oh, praise the Lord, instead of, oh, oh, I haven't read that much this week. No, instead we're building one another up. I'm glad that this even, this admonition is a corporate, it's a plural admonition. Yourselves, build yourselves up. Encouraging one another in the word. You do that. We heard that this morning. For parents, an encouragement in the word. Reminder of God's faithfulness. We, you hear that week in and week out through the exposition of Scripture, through the encouragement of Scripture. We build ourselves up in the most holy faith by knowing God's Word. We are under the authority of God's Word. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's what your mission statement says. I looked it up. Um, under the authority of God's Word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Redemption Hill Church will be a gospel-centered church that worships God, loves one another, and proclaims the gospel to the world building one another up, being means of grace to the world around you to declare the gospel, rooted and centered in God's word, built upon God's word, under the authority of God's word and the power of the spirit. So what does Jude say? Stay in the car. There's so many other things we could do, right? There's, there's so much more we could do. No, it's just these simple things that he's delivered up that are powerful in the hands of God, powerful through his people. What he intends to accomplish. And here are two temptations that can confront us as we just think about these simple things. One, we can say, God is keeping us or me from something good. I want to get out of the car. Two temptations. These, these simple things here, God's word, what he has delivered. We can say, well, this restricts me too much. God's commands are too restricting. God's word is too restricting. Some people could say this. Something essential is being missed. I, I want this and God says no. God is keeping from me something I want. Thus God is keeping me from something that is good. The sinister way in which it can begin to work in our hearts. Maybe this way. Maybe you've heard this. God gave me the desire for this. If God gave me, the, gave me this desire, how could it be wrong? God's word is what defines what's right and wrong. And as we build on God's word, then in faith we're saying, we're building ourselves. I believe your word, Lord. I believe it. I trust it. My life is built upon it. Verse 10 demonstrates an extreme form of this in Jude. It's talking about the false teachers. It says, they blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand extinct instinctively so there's this instinct we know we yeah the problem is is sin right and we know the instinct 
Because of the fall, we are inclined to sin. Now, as his people, we have remaining sin that we battle, that we're engaged in battling. And so there's this temptation oftentimes for us. God is keeping us from something good. But not only something good, we need to help God out. So while there's the licentiousness of God is keeping me from something good, it's a desire I have and I want it. So it must be good, ultimately. And that's, that's a degenerative way of thinking that, that any of us could be tempted to move down. The other way is I need to do something in order to make myself more acceptable before God. Legalism, the other ditch. I need to help God out. God says what he has done for me at the cross is enough, but I'm not sure. I think he may need my help. He calls me his beloved. And what can be tempting in that is this idea of I will be loved if I perform If I perform something for the Lord, then I will be loved. Listen, what he has done is sufficient. He has performed what is necessary. He has provided what is needed. His spirit has indwelt you. You can't add to that. You don't want to try to add to that. That's folly. No, just sit in the car. (laughs) Remain in the love of God that he's provided for you. He loves you. He loves you. And the cross is the testimony of that for you. Don't need to help God out. He calls me his beloved. Remain in the love of God, friends. Reflect on divine love. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I recognize that in our experience as these false teachers were coming into the church, they, the primary channel of their influence were these false teachers. You had a, a, a much more closed life, right? Instead of, you had to be geographically close to one another to learn from one another. You generally had to hear someone audibly. You, you had very little writing at the time that was passed, or you couldn't just hand someone a book. You certainly didn't have what we have. FaceTime, face chat. I can't remember them all. I need to go down a bunch of stuff. Um, You don't have all of of that. And so that means that some of the influencers that that we face, some of the teachers, we call them influencers. It's not cool to call people teachers anymore. I can't wait until in school. It's all going to be influencers, isn't it? It's like, man, these. Okay, all you influencers talking to second and third grade teachers. Um, I'm old. I'm going to keep calling them teachers, I think, until I'm gone. Um, Ideas come to us from an almost innumerable number of channels. And so it's no longer just false teachers. It It can be someone's. Facebook page, influencers on Instagram, whatever it may be. And then, so what, what's he saying? Keep yourself in the love of God by building yourselves up in your most holy faith so that you can discern what is true and what is not based on God's word. Keep yourselves there, saints. Jude calls the apostates teachers worldly people devoid of the spirit. There's the missing element, devoid of the spirit. Everyone who's born again has the spirit. Anyone who does not have the Spirit, Romans 8, is not of God, born again. It's not surprising when we give ourselves to everything but God in his word that we find ourselves so far away from him in our experience that there's this existential disconnect. It's like what's real for me is during the week. And this is where my congregation brought this to me. A few of them were like, I really struggle, Daryl. I hear what you're saying, but I'm struggling with this idea of I'm, I'm living in this world all day long that is more and more has discontinuity with what the Bible says. More and more I feel disconnected. I talk with people and they, they have no idea. It's like, foof. I mean, the, people that grow to, grew up in the same neighborhoods I grew up in, they don't have the church background. I have to start at square one. We may have to, saints. I just start at square one. Genesis, we may have to go back to just one. In the beginning, God. There is a God who created, made us. We may have to do that. Saying, stay in the car, remember the love of the Lord for you, that his love doesn't only equal just the fact that he's saved you for heaven, but he's put you here in this place and this time for his purposes, to work through you. Keep yourself in the love of God by building yourself up in the most holy faith. Number two, keep yourself in the love of God by praying in the Holy Spirit. You see, I'm real creative here. I'm just taking the very words from verse 20, verse 21. Praying in the Holy Spirit. And so he goes from this faith that's developing, that's rooted in God's word, that's centered in Christ, this growing faith to prayer. 
Keep yourself in the love of God by praying in the Holy Spirit. This is clearly a a progression of of dependence from faith to prayer. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, faith is the first grace, the root of piety, the foundation of holiness, the dawn of godliness, which is, by the way, a gift of God. To this must the first care be given. But we must not tarry at the first principles. Onward is our course. And then he says this. What then follows at the heels of faith? What is faith's firstborn child? When the vine of faith becomes vigorous and produces fruit unto holiness, which is the first ripe cluster, is it not prayer? Praying in the Holy Spirit? That man has no faith who has no prayer. And the man who abounds in faith will soon abound in supplication. Faith, the mother, and prayer, the child, are seldom apart from one another. We read that about prayer and we say, wow, I don't, um, I don't, I don't pray enough. It'd be easy, again, just to stand up here and pray more. <laughs> and in one sense, you're like, yes, pray more. There's nothing shameful about that. In fact, so much so, the scripture says, pray without ceasing. There's a posture of openness to God as he leads us. It doesn't mean stopping and closing your eyes. It means an awareness that God is working through you, with you, and using you in the places he has put you. But the emphasis here is this idea that if you've been born again, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about a particular gift. He's talking about a particular state. We are born again, then we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Then he's saying pray out of that vital relationship that you have with God through the work of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in an ongoing way. Your dependence on the Spirit is evidenced by your prayer life, your awareness. I need the Spirit. And so we pray. We give ourselves to prayer regularly. And when we don't, we say, Lord, help me grow in this way. There's some temptations in this. There are some sins that that sap our prayer life, some sins that sap my prayer life. Number one, by sin can tempt us to to think that prayer is fruitless. And the most subtle way for us as doctrines of grace, essentially reformed people, believing in the sovereignty of God, is to think God's going to do it anyway. Anyway. Therefore, why pray? Now, that, that is not the teaching of Scripture. God ordains the end, the means as well as the ends. Prayer is one of the means that he gives to his people. It's the Spirit working through his people to accomplish what he desires to accomplish. And so we want to think of it more in terms of we have the privilege to pray. It is, it is essentially, prayer is essentially this. It is love for God expressed. <laughs> That's what it is. God first loved us, saved us. The response that we have is prayer. All of our response to God is, Lord, I belong to you. What do I have but you? Who do I want but you? That's prayer. And so in in the Psalms, we see prayer sometimes like, Lord, what are you doing? Why'd you leave me in the car alone? (laughs) He didn't. But it feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Why is everything falling apart? I thought you were supposed to help me. In this journey, why, why are my children sick? Why are, they, why are family members not born again? Why am I sick? Thought you loved me. Be tempted that way, can't we? Might as well not pray because, you know, I'm a good sovereign. He's going to do it. That's not the relationship the Lord had. He is sovereign. He will accomplish what he will do. But he loves you, beloved. It's not a disaffected sovereignty. It's a loving sovereignty. It's divine love for you. And the reciprocation of that is prayer. Praying in the Spirit. Do you think that Abba Father is a disaffected description of God's pathway for you? That that you're coming to the sovereign, holy Lord of all and he says... Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as his children by whom we cry, what? Abba, Father, run to him as his children. To his knee, we, we, we pray, oh Lord, do we love you. You love us. We're fighting for faith. 
through spirit-empowered prayer. Help us see what we cannot see on our own. Open our eyes afresh to the glories of the gospel. That's the way you wage war against false doctrine in your life. See the love of God first. And then go after God's word empowered by him knowing he has for you. He has for you his eternal purposes. And he will accomplish it. Pray, saints. Pray with, with confidence in him. Assurance that he loves you. Hudson Taylor said, the hardest part of a missionary career is to maintain regular prayer and Bible study. I'm like, that's the Christian life. Satan, he says, will always find you something to do. He would say, when you ought to be occupied about that, if it is only arranging a window blind, he said, always something to do. Again, saints, we, the, the point of this is not to bury it. It's to wake us up to what we have in the love of God through Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. What a privilege. Oh, we are beloved. We are beloved. Beloved, give yourself to prayer. Spend, just spend specific time in prayer. And, and I'm sure you are corporately here. Gather corporately in prayer. I think even as you gather in the mornings before service, there's a number that are gathering to pray for the service. Have a regular time for prayer, but let it be motivated first by God's love for you, and then let it be a response of love to him. Let it, let it be a response of love to him. That's what our obedience is, right? It's a response of love. If you love me, Jesus, you keep my commandments. We don't earn his favor. He loves us. He changes our hearts. We now have a desire and love for him, and we run after him in love. Do you think of prayer as a means of grace for you? Is it a means by which God himself empowers your perseverance in the faith? Namely, that God himself, the Holy Spirit, helps you pray. So then when you start to pray, look to the Holy Spirit who has been appointed by the Father and purchased through the Son to help you in this sweet service. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit bears part of the burden, even in prayer. Number three, keep yourselves in the love of God by waiting eagerly for the return of Jesus. Referring to Christ's mercy is pretty unusual in the New Testament. And the way that it's stated here in verse 21 Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's what we're talking about. Stay in the car, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. It's another way of saying waiting for the return of Christ, but there's an emphasis on mercy. And it would make sense that there would be an emphasis on mercy here because the tendency could be, hey, we're the called ones. He's addressing us, those who are the faithful ones. All those rascally apostates, he spent a long time rebuking them appealing to them, but we the holy ones, right, are, are those who are called, chosen by God. And so Jude serving us, the Holy Spirit serving us, reminds us that we are awaiting mercy. That when Christ returns, what we would deserve in and of ourselves is God's wrath and judgment. We should not be happy about the return of Christ by nature. There should be no joy inherent in this idea that the Lord is returned. That should terrify us. But in Christ, because of his grace and mercy toward us in Jesus, we have this awareness that when Christ shows himself, we will be covered, right, in a righteousness that is not our own and accepted, where otherwise we would never be accepted. So remember mercy. What does this do? This even empowers you for mercy for others. Where does he go in verse 22, which we don't have time to look at, but I'm going to mention right now. Show mercy. Right? Show mercy to others. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. So he's saying, look, there are those among you who doubt. Show mercy to them because what they're going to get when Jesus arrives, mercy in Christ. Others remind them of the gospel. They may be near the hellfires. They may be living in a way that is 
sinful. You remind them of that. Snatch them. Remind them of the gospel. Plead with them to return to the Lord. And then even those false teachers whose garments are stained, there's that defiled terminology. Even those, we are to be merciful even to those because ultimately it is God who is the judge who meets out justice in the end. May God save many of them. Maybe some of us here were those false teachers. We said it this morning. Who can God save? Any sinner. <laughs> that's, that's the field. Who can God save? Any sinner. How does he do that? He opens their eyes to the glories of Christ. He allows them to see the cross. He enables them to understand the gospel. He convicts them of sin and they bow the knee before the cross and say, Woe is me, for I am undone. And God gives them a new heart. Now we're to be in mercy awaiting the day of Christ's return. This past week, have you reflected on the return of Christ? It seems like something in the New Testament that they constantly remind us of. And I'm thinking, Lord, do I really reflect on it that much? I mean, life's pretty good here. Got my ice machine, my recliner. Aren't we? We're easily satisfied. And it dulls our senses if we're not careful. So, well, life's really pretty easy here. I just want it to be all worked out here. But then we have things that hit us every day, don't we? Illness, broken relationships, our own sin, a broken world. And then we remember, don't we? We remember, oh, Lord, come quickly. Maranatha, Lord. Come reconcile all things to yourself. We're to be postured towards the Lord with come quickly, Lord. As we remain. In the love of Christ. Remain in the love of God. Keep yourself there. Stay in the car, saints. If by car we mean the safety of God's love. I don't, again, I, I want to make sure that as we track through, we see where Jude lands here. Because... When we think about staying in the car, we're engaged in this process of sanctification. We've been justified by the finished work of Jesus. We've been redeemed. We've sung about it all morning long. You heard it described as John talked about the communion. Aaron referred to God's work. We, we've highlighted God's grace in salvation. And you could get to the end of this sermon. You could think, okay, Daryl, what can I do? <laughs> or maybe I, I don't think I can do anything. No, you're empowered to obey. You can obey this morning. Not to earn anything from the Lord. But, but to demonstrate a love for Christ, a demonstrate a, a changed and renewed heart, to live out the life that he's called you to do. That's just response. You haven't earned anything with him that is meritorious on the last day. You're still in need of mercy when he shows up. The righteousness of Christ makes us acceptable. So much so that Jude wants to make sure we don't miss it, right? I'm not sure I can keep myself. You can't. I can't. I'm not able to keep myself. The fact that we all need mercy reminds us that none of us are perfected yet. The battle is still ongoing. But, but saints, don't let the battle become the end game for you. Let the victory of Jesus Christ become the end game. The work of Christ on the cross, the gospel, which delivers up a glorious resurrection, which delivers up a glorious reunion with the one you love, which delivers up what Jude says in Jude 24 as he just breaks off into doxology. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's what he's able to produce. He's able to produce this glorious product which is your full sanctification. You standing before the Holy One that we talked about, the one who created all things, who has no shadow of turning, to be able to stand before him, how? Blameless. Now that's crazy. That, that doesn't match what I would think of myself, but it matches what God has said about me in the person and work of his son, Jesus. Here's the glory of the gospel that at the end, this laboring, this remaining in the car, remaining being kept in the love of God because we are kept. He's in the car. He never leaves us or forsakes us. The analogy breaks down here because we have an indwelling Holy Spirit 
We are never left by the Lord. For those who are redeemed, he walks with us. He keeps us. He transforms us. He changes us. And at the end, he says, here's eternal life for you. That's insane. Gloriously insane. Maybe the wrong word to use. I get excited when I say these words. Insane. It blows my mind, saints. It, it's, in, it's to blow your mind. See, this is, this is the orientation of worship. Minds blown by the grace of God who is majestic and powerful and glorious and loves you. You are the beloved of God. You are those who have been loved by God. Therefore, you what? Love God. If your love is waning this morning, Let me encourage you. Stay in the car. Remember what Jesus has done. Go back to the word. Oh, Lord, I believe your promises. I believe your truth. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It's where we go. And it's not just the letter that hits us. It's the words of God that transform and change us, that encourage us, that buoy us up. You know the difference, don't you, between just the cold letter and the glorious word of God to your heart. Regenerate person. If you're here and you are not in Christ, you think, I don't know. You're talking about great things. They don't seem great to me. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. Today, rehearse the cross. Consider your sins, whatever you call them, failures, weaknesses, deficiencies, challenges, the areas you need therapy on, whatever you call them. Your brokenness, if that's what you call them. Consider that. And then consider a God who has no sin, no shadow of turning, dwells in unapproachable light. says, I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to be your Lord through my son. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. Turn to the cross. Believe today. Confess your sins and know the Lord. Christian, We get to stay in the car. We get to just remain in the love of God until that great day. Committing ourselves to the God, Father, Son, and Spirit who loves us. Beloved, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Lord, these these truths are too great, too glorious. Um, For a day, they're too, too great, too glorious for a lifetime. They are sufficient truth for eternity. Our celebration and worship of you, Lord, forever. So thank you. Thank you for your work of salvation. Thank you. We are kept in Christ that we might remain in the love of God by virtue of your care and direction. Thank you for the means that you've given us. Now, Lord, I pray you'd write these truths upon our heart that we might love you, enjoy you, and obey you. In Jesus' name, amen.